And now, please welcome to the stage, Editor-in-Chief of Programmable Web, David Berlin. All right, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here on the big stage at MuleSoft Connect in London. Uh, I was here for the very first MuleSoft Connect. It was about five years ago. Uh, there's, I'm told there's about 1,200 people in the room. There's only about a 100, 200 people back then. So this is an amazing growth of this event. Thank you for coming. Thank you for staying and listening to me. So uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my personal journey with APIs, my personal love affair with APIs. And there's probably a bunch of you in the audience saying, well, that's kind of gratuitous. You're in an API event. Of course you're going to get on stage and talk about how much you love APIs, David. But it's really true. And I'm going to tell you why. Back in the 1980s, I got out of college. Uh, I was a developer. I had some great coding skills. And I went to work for an organization where my job was to go out and visit with the business users in the community and find out what it was they needed to be developed in the way of customized software. Because back then, for those of you who were around in the 80s, there wasn't a whole lot of off-the-shelf software for PCs. So my job was basically to sit down in consultation with these users, listen to what they wanted, and go back to my desk and code it up. But one of the things I realized when I participated in these consultations was that these users really had no idea of what the machine was capable of in the hands of a competent developer like me. And so then I realized I had to change my approach to this job. Part of what I had to do was coach these users to be a little bit more ambitious about what they were thinking about, because I could do so much more for them. Imagine something bigger, better, broader. One of the reasons I would do this is because when I got back to my desk, based on these skills that I had acquired in college, I was able to leverage the APIs that were in the system, the PC APIs that were in, at that time, DOS and then later Windows, right? And those APIs made me super productive as a developer. In fact, back then, coding up PC applications was a bit of an enigma to anybody. They thought of you as a miracle worker if you could do that sort of thing. And quite frankly, it was quite a miracle because I would turn these applications around in record time very much thanks to APIs. They made me so much more productive. I was able to build applications at light speed. And so I really started my love affair with APIs back then because not only was I impressing the clients that I was going out to meeting with and giving them the software that they wanted and even something better, I was also impressing my leadership, my boss, and I was getting big raises and getting promoted. Awesome, APIs. They were instrumental in my early career. About six or seven years later, I took a job as the senior technical analyst of networking in the labs at PC Week, one of the top industry publications back then. Does anybody in this room remember PC Week? We have any anybody? I see a few hands up. Okay, the rest of you probably weren't born yet. That's all right. And my job was to review products and write those reviews. While I was there, I saw this new emergent class of APIs. These APIs that were on a network. That was a little bit different than the APIs I was used to working with as a developer. But having that experience with APIs, I automatically recognized the potential of having an API on a network. Now, the APIs we're talking about were the APIs for Microsoft Mail, which later became Microsoft Exchange Server, and that was called Mappy. Then there was Vim. That was an API for something called Lotus Notes. Anybody here use Lotus Notes in their lifetime? Just about every hand's going up. How many people are still using Lotus Notes? Like two hands, okay, all right. There was also MHS, Message Handling Service, from a company called Novell. 
Some of you may remember Novell from those days. And so I went to my leadership at PC Week and I said, hey, I think we should do a special report on this new emergent class of APIs. I think it's that important. It would be very leading of us as a publication to do this. They said, great, David, love the idea. How about you lead that special report? So I did. And just before we went to print, I went to the artists and I said, hey, on the cover of this special report, I would like a blue puzzle piece or multiple puzzle pieces. And they said, why is that? I said, well, the way I see it is that these APIs are kind of like puzzle pieces. When you snap them together to form a bigger jigsaw puzzle, the whole becomes much greater than the sum of its parts. And so as you can see on the cover of that special report, this is October of 1992, you see that blue puzzle piece right there in the middle. And today, that puzzle piece is still incredibly iconic, not only in my life, but the lives of the entire programmable web team where I work. It is a part of the programmable web logo, if you go to programmableweb.com. Now, for those of you not familiar with programmable web, we are the official journal of the API economy. We're the only journal of the API economy. No other online site or journalistic organization wakes up every morning thinking about what it is we're going to write about when it comes to APIs that day. The other thing we're really well known for is we run the world's largest independent directory of public APIs. This is where millions of developers come every single year to research what APIs they're going to use in the next application they build to create something where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And the other thing we're known for is API University. API University is a giant archive of content that we continue to build today. You click about learn about APIs at the very top of our homepage or any page for that matter, it'll take you there. And we have content for people who are at any stage of their API journey. If you're a beginner and don't know what an API is and really want to get up to speed so you can have an intelligent conversation with somebody about them, we have that. If you're pretty well practiced at it and want to read up on API security, learn how to use GraphQL, the latest API technologies, we have that too. So we're a great place to come visit no matter where you stand in your journey. I'm David Berlin. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Programmable Web. And today I want to talk to you about putting the I back into CIO. Now what do I mean by that? Because you just heard Ross up here constantly talking about innovation. So in the back of your minds you might be thinking, like a lot of people think, he's talking about the Chief Innovation Officer. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going back to that conversation that I had with the business users at the organization that I work with, where I had to sit down and get them to imagine something more ambitious. I'm talking about imagination. I'd like to posit that for the last couple of decades, if you're a CIO or you're in IT, you've been really focused at kind of keeping the lights on. Figure out a way to do more with less because we don't get all kinds of new money for our budgets. But now, with the power of the API economy, we have a new opportunity to revisit that conversation with the business side of our organizations. To get them to start imagining something a little bit different than that which they've been imagining for the last couple decades. So I'm talking about taking those of you who are chief information officers or working in the information technology department and becoming mentors, coaches, culture changers, chief imagination officers and the imagination technology department. 
Now the fundamentals of this idea are all baked into something called an API strategy blueprint that Programmable Web developed in partnership with MuleSoft. Now this is a little bit different than the three stages to executing an API strategy that Ross just talked about. These are the fundamentals of your API strategy essentials. And if you go to the MuleSoft homepage and you click on this big link that says API strategy essentials, it'll lead you to a white paper that goes into great detail about these four pillars. I'm gonna talk about them briefly. I'm not gonna go and do a deep dive on them right now. The first of these pillars is to decide on what your business strategy is, your digital strategy. Shouldn't even be talking about API strategy at this point. And by the way, this is not a waterfall exercise. All of these pillars are continually being iterated at your organizations. These are the fundamentals that you have to be great at. You have no choice. In this businessy strategy pillar, this is where you are imagining new customer experiences, new business outcomes, things that you couldn't really imagine before, the API economy. You're getting the organization aligned around those ideas. You're validating your ecosystems. You're validating those experiences with customers. You're getting executive backing. It's all business strategy stuff. No API discussion here. Then you have to lead a cultural revolution in your organizations. Because just like the business users that I met with whose imaginations were constrained, you're gonna have business users that are still thinking from a very constrained point of view. They're not clear on what the machine is capable of, especially with the power of APIs at their disposal. That's what you know. That's what I'm telling you today. That's what Ross just told you. So of course, they're not going to be imagining that thing that's more ambitious than they should be. And that's where you have to lead this cultural revolution. Because you're not facing the customers, they are. Your job isn't the business outcomes, theirs is. You just have to get them to change the way they think about the business. Still haven't talked about APIs yet, but now I will. Because once you have these two fundamentals in place, then you need to start thinking about what the enabling technology is. What are the API management systems? What are the security systems that you need? Testing systems, best practices. If you go out and do this first, you're doomed to fail. None of this software is gonna help you unless you really understand what it is your business is looking to accomplish. And you heard Ross talking about ecosystems, nurturing ecosystems, enabling ecosystems. Your ecosystem is going to consist of all of your constituents internally in your organization, external constituents, developers, partners, customers. This ecosystem is critical to the future of your API strategy. You have to be thinking about that too. And going back to the white paper that you can download, we have more white papers coming that are the essential double click on each of these pillars. And the next one that we're publishing today on Programmable Web is a full-blown paper on organizing your ecosystems for API success. So be sure to look for that. What I'd like to do is an experiment with everybody here in the room. Is everybody here up for an experiment? Yeah? No hand? Nobody wants to do an experiment? I should get off the stage. Okay, there we are. I was going to get off the stage. Come on. This is the fun part. A few months ago, I went around and I captured some video back in my hometown of Boston and then also in San Francisco. And what you're about to hear is the audio that goes with that video. What I'd like for you to do when I play this audio, so I want everybody in the room to close their eyes. 
and listen to that audio, focus on it, and imagine in your minds what exactly is making the sound that you're about to hear or that you're hearing. So everybody ready for this? Close your eyes. I see some open eyes here. I said close your eyes. Don't worry, we're not hypnotizing you or anything. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one. You can open your eyes now. So we did hypnotize you. You might want to check your wallets because we rifled through all your personal belongings. No. How many people in the room think that the person sitting closest to them imagined exactly what they imagined when they heard those sounds? I don't see one hand. Yeah. What does it tell you about the collective imagination of everybody in this room and how powerful that can be? We all have a different one of those imaginations. Has anybody seen a picture from like the 1930s or 40s where a family is gathered around a, an old radio in the living room? Anybody seen those pictures? Yeah, I see a bunch of hands going up. I can guarantee you that the people that were in that living room, the family, the mom, the dad, the kids, when they heard that drama unfolding on the radio, they all had different imaginations working, telling them what scenery was involved, what the characters looked like. As it turns out, video actually robs you of your imagination. The producers, the directors, the actors, they're turning your imagination off. And I like to argue that most business users at your organizations have their imaginations turned off. And this is why it's your job to turn them on. Okay, does anybody want to see the actual video that goes with that audio? Yes? Okay. There we go. It sounds like you're livening up a little bit. Okay, great. Here we go. that you could pop a kernel of popcorn with a hair straighter. <laughs> the things you can learn on YouTube, I gotta tell you. Now, if you're interested in scalable technologies, I promise you that that is not a scalable way to fill a bowl of popcorn. Stick to the microwave. How many people in the room imagined exactly what they just saw on the big screen here? I'm just proving my point. The collective imagination in this room doesn't even map to reality. That's how powerful it can be. Forget about what the reality is now. Let's imagine something completely different. If we took and harnessed the power of the 1,200 people in this room, we could imagine some really cool things. Imagine if you take that same principle back to your organizations and get the collective power of those organizations working. Things could be very different. The business outcomes could be very different. 
the revenue, the success, everything, customer experiences. To further prove my point, we're going to actually imagine something that was quite unimaginable only a few years ago. And I'd like to preface this with what you're about to see. The customer experience that we show you here is one that came from workshops that I've run with MuleSoft customers where I get them to imagine a different customer experience than that which they're accustomed to. Not for their organizations, but for something that we're all infinitely qualified to comment on, and that is the in-flight experience when you're flying somewhere. Because we've all done that, we all have our gripes, nobody's had a perfect experience. About six months ago, I received an email. This is a true story. I received this email. We've changed the name to protect the innocent. It was from Sufficient Airlines. Everybody, anybody fly Sufficient Airlines? And it promised me an in-flight experience that was tailored just to me. I was incredulous. I was like, really? I've flown first class, business class. What's the new one? Premium economy economy, and that really, really new one, what is it, cattle class? Is that the one way in the back where you have no leg room? And from one airline to the next, the experience is fairly average. It's a commodity. This is what I've come to expect. And this is generally what I get. Certainly not something that's tailored specifically to me as the email promised. Now, as it turns out, the experience of traveling, which we've all been through, is really a sequence of a bunch of moments of truth. And each one of those moments is an opportunity to really crush it. It starts with the reservation, and then eventually you ride to the airport, get out, check your bags, the desk, go through security, you go to the gate, you wait, they call your name, you get on the plane, take your seat, plane takes off, they feed you pretzels, if you're lucky. Seatback entertainment system, you turn that on, mess around with that. Plane lands, you get off, you go to a hotel, and then you do the whole thing in reverse. We've all done this. So in these workshops, which by the way, you're entitled to these workshops. I was talking to Raj backstage, and he's like, yeah. How often do you come to, the, to London, David? I'm like, I can be here. So if you want one of these workshops at your organization, just talk to Raj. We focused on the CPAC entertainment system because we knew that that could be different. We could reimagine that experience. And you know the CPAC entertainment system, how it works. You sit down and it gives you a language to operate the system in, pick your language, then you decide whether you want to watch TV, maybe look at some movies, watch the flight path, maybe you pick a movie, the star is born, you watch the trailer, you get out your wired headphones, you stick them in the audio jack and it doesn't work. Anybody have that experience? As much as I fly, it's about half the time. Real bummer. It's not really tailored to me or any of the other 249 passengers on the jet. What if we changed that system? What if we reimagined it? What if when you sat down at that seat, it welcomed you? What if it recognized on the previous leg of your flight, things didn't go so well, and it offered you free Wi-Fi or free food as a make good to keep your loyalty. Or maybe you could attach those $300 noise canceling headphones to the CPAC entertainment system and get the benefit of those. After all, you're traveling all over the world with them. How about if on the previous leg of your trip, you ate some food that recorded what it is you bought on that flight and based on what you bought and consumed, they preloaded the next flight with food that you're likely to buy with the help of a partner like Amazon Go or Gate Gourmet or whoever loads the jet. 
How about if your plane, the first leg, landed early and you didn't get to finish the movie you were watching and it knew that and it offered you an opportunity to pick up that same movie exactly where you left off. Imagine if that happened between different airlines. That would really be cool. Or maybe because you've programmed your frequent flyer account with the connections to your HBO and your Netflix and your Hulu and your Pandora, it offers you the opportunity to continue binge watching Game of Thrones on HBO. That would really be a personalized experience, wouldn't it? You would have something that was very different from everybody else on the jet. And this is entirely possible. There's nothing that keeps this experience from being built. We have an infinite amount of compute power, storage and networking in the cloud, and thanks to multiple companies that are want to provide that to you, the price is coming down, so that's not a problem. We have artificial intelligence and machine learning at pennies on the dollar compared to the millions that it cost just a few years ago. Some of it's free, open source. So you can do all the predictive analytics to figure out what food to load the jet with just in time. And getting that data from one jet to the next, streaming it, what we call inventing. We have all those technologies. They've been baked in the last couple of years. So that's in place too. There's nothing that keeps you from getting data from one place to the other just in time. And finally, we've got the API economy. It's like wind in our sails. So, not only can we imagine this great customer experience, we can build it. There's nothing keeping us from doing it. Problem is, the airlines haven't imagined it, at least not the ones I fly. Now, we just focused on one moment of truth in that sequence of events. Imagine if you took that same imagination and applied it, applied it to the entire end-to-end -end customer experience, to every one of the other moments of truth. Now you're really talking about a personalized customer experience, an amazing one that would generate so much loyalty with the airline that it would put a significant amount of distance between you in first place in the airline industry and all of your competitors. Now in order to change the culture of your company and get it moving in this direction where it's thinking much more broadly about the end-to-end -end customer experience like this, you have to use what's called outside-in thinking. You'll hear more about this at this event. Today, the problem is your company is full of people who are stuck thinking about what it is your company already does and just how to do that better. So when you hear a lot of these messages about legacy modernization and digital transformation, in many cases, the only step they take is to take the existing systems, put APIs on them, and then push what experiences can be built on those APIs out to your customers, and that's the end of it. I can promise you that if you follow this approach, you will fail. It's just not a big enough strategy. It's not ambitious enough thinking. We see it all the time already. In fact, we report on it. We see companies actually going out of business and other companies having to pivot on programmable web. The way to really go about this is what we call outside-in thinking. Forget about what it is your company is really good at right now. Keep it in mind, but don't start there. Start from the customer's point of view. What would just be an incredible user experience, never mind what it is your company's core competencies are? Just think about what would be the absolute best customer experience. This is the question we ask MuleSoft's customers when we do these workshops with them. Then take a look at your core competencies and spot the gap, reconcile it. Say, wait a minute, what we just thought of as a great customer experience, we only can provide about 40% of that. Well, yeah, that's okay. That is perfectly okay. Because the next thing you do 
is you identify the potential partners that it can help you complete that experience. And you go out and you reach out to them and say, what do you think? Our customers are your customers. Together we can partner on these incredible customer experiences. More than likely they'll agree. Then you work out the business terms. Is the revenue involved? How are you going to share it? What are the benefits to everybody? Do you notice I'm not even talking about APIs yet, right? Because it's only after you get all this worked out, which is really the business strategy, that you start to talk about, okay, well, what APIs do we need to enable this great experience? How do we get manifest data to our content partners? How do the content partners get login data and last watched videos and binge watching to the Seatback Entertainment System? Again, it's all possible. And then you worry about the design of those APIs, very end. It's kind of like the tail wagging the dog because when you get done with this whole process, you suddenly have an API strategy. You used a business strategy, a great business strategy, based on customer experiences that will potentially generate more revenue and at the very least more loyalty, and you ended up with an API strategy. It's not that difficult to come up with these API strategies. And not only that, you end up with an ecosystem. And this is a template that we at Programmable Web invented to visualize the ecosystems of various companies that have really good ecosystems up and running. And if you look for that ecosystem white paper I was telling you about, you'll see how we talk about a couple different companies and use this visualization tool. And what this shows is, is that you have a single platform in the middle. That's you. That's your core competencies wrapped with an API-led strategy. But then you are serving different constituents from that single platform. On the bottom side, you're serving your internal developers, and they're building maybe digital applications, uh, mobile applications for your customers. But on the top side, that same platform is serving your partners, and they're building entirely different experiences. And the net result is, is that your customers, wherever they are, are coming into this ecosystem through different channels, and those different channels bring different benefits to your business. Maybe more loyalty, maybe more revenue, they may have different business models associated with them. These ecosystems create those opportunities to build those new channels. Again, this is all in the API strategy blueprint. It's free for the taking. Just go up to the website. It's also on Programmable Web. And we have more content coming. So the day after tomorrow when this event is over, I hope you'll go home and read that strategy blueprint. But most importantly, I hope you go back to your organizations and lead this revolution where you have to get everybody else in the company thinking from the outside in and imagining the sorts of customer experiences that your customers will really appreciate. Thank you, and I'll see you at the break.